Welcome to Real Estate 360 Live with Ryan Sloper, the trusted name in real estate radio. Now, here's Ryan Sloper. Welcome, everyone, to another episode and podcast of Real Estate 360 Live. I'm your host, Ryan Sloper. For those of you not familiar with the podcast, my guest and I will cover every angle of real estate under the sun from interest rates to the economy to what's happening in Washington. Um, anything that's pertinent to you being able to make a better educated, more informed decision on your real estate, um, it could be in regards to mortgages, it could be in regards to real estate, your credit. Uh, we cover a bunch of different topics, but we really try to break it down on, on more of an elementary level so that you can understand a lot of the things that are taking place in the markets, things that are on the economic calendar such as PPI, CPI, retail sales, um, inflation, in general, the Federal Reserve, what they're doing with their, with, uh, you know, their policies, QE, what, what all these things mean to you if you were trying to buy a house right now. And obviously, it's a moving target at all times. Uh, we've said time and time again on this show that basically our economy is built around what the Fed says and does. It's an artificially built economy, um, which, is, which is not a good thing. We have a part-time worker economy. Um, and I know a lot of these things may sound foreign to you, but if you've been listening to the show for any time now, we've kind of really um, took a deep dive into these different topics. Uh, and if you haven't listened to any of our previous podcasts, you can catch them on iTunes. You can download there. You can subscribe. And we'd uh, love for you to share the show with other people that may get the benefit from this. Uh, so if you go to iTunes, search in the search bar, Real Estate Through 60. Uh, you'll pull up the show there where you can download and subscribe it. And it's also you don't have iTunes for some reason, you can also stream it directly from the website at realestate360live.com. Also, on the right-hand side, there's an Ask a Question button for any questions that you may have. If you'd like to cover a certain topic on a future episode, we'd be glad to do that. So that's realestate360live.com. Joining me on our panel, as he does each and every week, is Louis Camrosano, who is a former school teacher, a former attorney and a former general manager of a major real estate portal. Lewis is often cited in the media as a real estate industry expert in the Wall Street Journal, Forbes, Fox Business, USN, Wall Street, MSN, CNN, and numerous others. How are you doing today, Lewis? Doing fine, Ryan. How are you? I'm doing well, sir. Thanks for yeah, asking. Um, so, you know, over the last week or so, the markets have been, I want to say, somewhat tame. Obviously, we've had mortgage interest rates, which have dipped down to basically historic lows again. Um, still not getting the necessary traction that I'd like to see out of real estate. Now, I will tell you that I have seen over the last couple of weeks that there's been a pretty substantial pickup in, in, in the lower price range, which obviously is going to be a lot more sensitive to <coughs> rate, re, rate reductions, right? Mm -hmm. So it's going to put them more in a situation where they're looking at what the rent cost is versus what the buy cost is, and the lower these rates go, the more sense that it makes sense for them to pay attention to it. So I have seen some, some uh, you know, some pickup in a lower price range. But I did want to mention, so there's a, there's been a couple of articles out, and really realtytrack.com, they track basically all of the all-cash sales that have been taking place. And so the second quarter, um, all-cash sales were down. Um, from 42% the prior quarter to 38%. But I still want to just hit on that number. 38% of all home sales in the second quarter were cash deals. There is, n there is no way that that's a good statistic for anybody looking at it or paying attention to it, okay? That means that still almost, I mean, we're over a third, getting close to still a half of all the home sales are by from institutional buyers or investors, hedge funds, and, and, and those that are basically been buying the market for, for you know, some time now, um, that number is now down just 4% from the prior quarter. But I think one of the main reasons, Lewis, also was why they're down is not necessarily that they stopped buying, that a lot of them have stopped buying, but also there's just not as many deals for them to find right now, right? Uh, you've got Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, a lot of the, the in the bigger banks that have been foreclosing on homes or putting homes up for auction or whatever they may be doing, they're trying to sell their, their homes for retail value and not necessarily giving away these things like they were years ago. So 38% of all homes right now are still cash deals, and I wanted to bring up a couple cities in particular. Um, we still have out in Las Vegas, um, Detroit, Kansas City, Cleveland, Philadelphia, they all had at least 45% of cash, and I believe last, Las Vegas was 50% of all home sales were cash. 
Um, and if we go further down south, cities that have been really attractive to like foreign investors, um, like Miami, uh, Orlando, Cape Coral, Sarasota, Tampa, all in Florida, uh, we've got 64% of sales were cash. In New York, 48% of sales were cash. Um, so, Lewis, would you agree with me? It, it, this is really a you know a cash-based economy when it comes to real estate. I mean, real, realistically, I think it really shows the struggle of people that even could that do have the ability to get a loan. Um, to still be able to potentially secure a home when you still have these high percentage of cash sales, this is what the everyday average Joe that can get a loan is up against. They're up against these all all cash deals, um, making it very difficult when they do find a house um, that maybe a deal per se. Let's say that it's a foreclosure. Um, you know, cash can typically win, and, and it doesn't have to win with the highest price. I mean, it could be. Instead of a, a you know a, a two hundred thousand price with a loan, if it's one hundred eighty thousand closing in seven days, I think that banks are more inclined to look at those because there's no contingencies involved. Uh, I want to get your take kind of on this this continuing trend of all cash sales. Obviously, we we kind of had said that we figured that these were going to start to tail off because many of the hedge funds and invest and institutional buyers are getting stuck holding a lot of these properties, so it's putting kind of a bad taste in their mouth. They're now moving their funds out of there and into the stock market. But I want to kind of get your take overall on um, uh, on your perception of, of these cash sales and as well as where you think things are headed. Well, the cash sales, Ryan, indicate, you know, the high percentage of cash sales, <coughs> excuse me, indicate a distortion in the market. And normally, you have a much lower percentage of cash sales. You have a much higher percentage of first-time home buyers who are traditionally getting mortgages and not – plunking down cash. The large cash buyers have driven the prices up. So it's kind of a self-correcting um, dynamic in a distorted market. As they drive the prices up themselves and they become the market, they also then stop buying them when they reach a certain level, when they realize that there's no return to be had. The quick picking, the easy pickings are now gone. So what you see now is the percentage of sales from cash are declining, and so are the uh, overall sales. You've got a 10% decline year over year, and that coincides with fewer cash sales, which right. highlights that the market is weak without the cash sales. Now, the market is strong because of the cash sales because it drives prices up, and it, it sells homes quicker because if you have cash in hand, as you mentioned, there's no contingencies. You go in, you buy the, the home, you buy it quickly, and you buy it for wouldn't say top dollar, but you buy it for a decent dollar. And sometimes right. there's there's uh, bidding wars for cash on some of these properties, and that also has the impact of rising prices. But as volume comes down and as these investors are slowly leaving the market and figuring out whether they're gonna how they're gonna rent these places out, the ones that they bought for rent, not for flip, you'll start to see decline in volume. And then, you know, you'll have an opportunity for these low interest rates for people to take advantage of them and maybe not have to compete with the cash buyers. However, they may not have to compete with the cash buyers. They may get a good deal on the mortgage, but they've lost a, they're now paying 20 to 30% more than they would have paid two or three years ago. So it's, it's kind of a consolation prize that they now can perhaps buy a home after it's been bid up. Yeah, and, and you know the other component to the cash sales, Lewis, is that there's no appraisal needed on a, on a cash sale, right? No. So, so it's if, no if, loan. If we have, the bank doesn't right. care what you want to do. There is no bank. Exactly. exactly. So if we have a five, you got to get your um, you have to get your investors to agree. And in many cases, you just give your. If there's many of these guys who flip homes. They collect money from investors. They don't have to approve the deals. Exactly. And, and let's just say that we had a, a home for five hundred thousand. That is, uh, you know, ends up getting bid up to five hundred and fifty thousand dollars on an all cash sale. Uh, there, since there is no appraisal required, and that sale closes in at five hundred and fifty thousand, that gets logged into the system um, right. as a as a closed sale. Now, if if there's a loan involved, let's say that property was only worth five twenty five, that person well, can't, well if it, if it was only a, you know appraised for five twenty five, they can only get a loan based upon a five twenty five right. sales price, not a five fifty sales price. So. That's the advantage that investors have is that it's just you just throw cash at it and you don't have to worry about it. Where, yep. um, you know, uh, people that have to get a loan, they don't have that much money at their disposal. 
they're, you know, I've, I've seen deals fall apart all day long because appraisals fall short by ten grand, and and they can't come up with the difference of the ten grand, and and then the seller says, well, I'm just going to put it back on the market. So, you know, it, it's 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 tough out there. I mean, it's tough for people that are cash strapped. It's great that you can get good financing with low down payments, but there's all sort of contingencies in place: financing contingencies, appraisal contingencies. Um, you know, if it's a condo, you could have an investor saturation of condos, which don't allow your financing to go through. Um, and I have seen, I think the biggest thing in this market is that you really, you just, you can't just assume um, that you know all your options. Because I find out each and every day, I think that, you know, I know majority of these options. Um, being pretty well versed in both, the, you know, the finance market and the real estate markets. And I'll find lenders that are starting that are doing quirky stuff that I thought wasn't possible. And really, that's just from talking to other people, finding out that certain banks are saying, "Oh, well, where we did require two years tax returns, now we only require one year's tax returns." And they start to make up their own rules. This typically happens when things are slowing down. When they well, you mentioned they're going to go to stated income loans. They're going to go to uh, adjustable rate mortgages just to drum up business. They're going to have to. And, and, And you know, on the flip side of that, you have basically like loan officers out there, like right, Morton, mortgage consultants. I don't know if you saw this, but there was an article that showed that Wells Fargo is their lackluster performance in the mortgage market. They finally have decided to raise their compensation for loan officers. They feel like that they're not getting enough business, purchase business, and the way that they're going to increase that is to raise up what their commissions are. Well, I kind of looked and I think it, it's like, let's just say it wasn't very much. It was like the difference between like 60 basis points and 70 basis points. It's right. So, like, literally 10 basis points is what they were talking about raising these people's commission up to. And I just have to kind of chuckle because, uh, you know, okay, a, a 10 basis point increase, you think that they're really going to want to increase their production that much? I can't see it. If you would have said, like, 40 basis points or something like that. Yeah, but then, even then, Ryan, the, the incentive may be there, but you still – you need to be able to offer the incentives to the, to the potential um, mortgage purchasers because – just because you have an incentive to sell, you don't have the client base to sell to well, under these circumstances. That, yeah, and you know what? I think that this is just how clueless people are sometimes. They feel like that just because you, you change compensation plans or you do whatever else that's getting creative, at the end of the day, it's still the consumer that has to be able to get right. the loan, right? And Ryan, and, interest rates, if you look at interest rates, everybody thinks the common wisdom is, well, lower interest rates will get more sales, it'll boost the housing market, when in fact, that sounds right, but it's counterintuitive because if we had market interest rates, you'd have a more normal market, people would be applying for mortgages, getting them, and home prices would be lower, and so people would be paying more on their mortgage, but they'd be paying less for their house, and you wouldn't have all these um, cash investors involved. So it created a distortion, not having normal market rates. They think just by lowering interest rates, they're going to create this economic boom. Instead, all they do is they create an economic boom for the people who can take advantage of it, which as we talked about on the show, are the wealthy who own stocks and have access to capital and can buy homes with it. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, it's it's a very small percentage of the population. As we and we're mentioned. not returning anytime soon. They're, the rates are lowering and they, they want this zero interest rate policy and they're going to get it and they want inflation too. Right. We're, we're, okay. we're, we're ha- we- Right, we have a we have a, a situation now where it's uh, it, you know as far as interest rates are concerned, it is, is a very opportune time for people to buy a home. But the reality is is that we have millions and millions and millions and millions of people throughout this country that are uh, part time workers that don't even have full time jobs. I mean, I think that this has been one of the biggest arguments is that you know okay, great, you know go get a loan, but you can't. I mean, if you've had that part time job for two years and you've got a history of it, you can. Um, but typically, part-time workers don't typically hold part-time right. jobs that, that long. It'd be um, like if the NBA was, was opening up um, 12 new teams, but there's not enough people who are 6 foot 5 to 7 foot. Yep. So it's a great opportunity if you happen to be 6, 5, 7 foot, but there just aren't that many people that are. Yeah, and, you know, <coughs> what, I'm, what I'm finding, too, I just heard rumblings the other day, was that HUD is trying to create a new program which would essentially reduce the mortgage insurance premiums on their loans. So as, as many people know, if you take out an FHA loan, which only requires a 3.5% down payment, there is monthly mortgage insurance and there's an upfront mortgage insurance premiums associated with those loans when you obtain them. So 
they've created this program, and it's not even like it's not completely done. They just started talking about it, but I would imagine it's probably going to get implemented this fall. And what it really was is, is okay, so there's monthly mortgage insurance right now of about 1.35% of the loan amount, which is very, very steep, right? Mm-hmm. So if, even even if even if you have a 4% interest rate, Lewis, it's really offset by this mortgage insurance. I would say it's almost the equivalent of having a 6% interest rate without mortgage insurance, right? So it's not it's not near as cheap as it appears. And then you have an upfront mortgage and premium insurance premium that you pay when you obtain a loan of about 1.75% of the loan amount. That typically gets financed on top of the loan amount. With their new program that they're proposing, if consumers would go and get counseling for, I don't know, let's just call it six hours the first time, they're willing to reduce that upfront premium from 1.75 down to 1.25 and reduce the monthly mortgage insurance premium from 1.35 to 1.25. And then if you go to another one-hour class after that, then they'll reduce it potentially another um, from 1.25 monthly to 1.1. Well, all this is is fine and dandy. It's still very expensive, right? Like the difference between 1.35 and 1.1 isn't really changing things all that much. And I think HUD, if they haven't noticed, the reason why their production has fallen off is because it's a very expensive loan. And, and, you know, People don't have to be brain dead to figure out that, yeah, they have a 4% interest rate, but their payment is like 6% because the monthly mortgage insurance premium. And you're tacking on, you're tacking on additional fees. A- absolutely. And not to mention that now pretty much that, that monthly mortgage insurance is there for the life of the loan. It used to be able you could get rid of it after That's five right. It's there for the life of the loan. I mean, nobody wants to be stuck with mortgage insurance for the life of the loan. So what are they doing? They're, they're either not buying because they don't want to take that loan or they're having to hold off until they can save enough up uh, for a down payment so they can go into a conventional loan where it's not as steep. Once again, that pushes things back further. Um, but as you mentioned, Lewis, this, yeah, this low interest rate environment is probably going to continue for some time. Um, without, without the benefits that they claim you're going to get because if you haven't had them to date, you're doing more of it, it's not going to increase <laughs> It's not going to reverse the, the the disadvantage and all of a sudden become a benefit. Right. So, it's not like there's a tipping point where if they keep lowering rates, everyone's going to finally just throw the towel in and have jobs and have cash and buy a home. It's it's not heading yeah. in that direction. It's going the other way. Right. Now, I mean, it is true if they were to raise rates, initially it would get worse. Yep. But eventually it would get better. They need to equalize. They need to get an equilibrium in the market. And they just understand how to distort it further. Correct. Yeah, and I mean, because I think one of the hard things for people to comprehend is, is like, well, interest rates are so low, I don't understand why, why it's so difficult to get a loan. Why, why do I feel like I'm running through an airport um, x-ray machine, right? Who wants to like, loan money at 2 or 3 yeah, Exactly. I mean, this is going – and the reason why they've tightened up rules to where, like, hey, if you have a large deposit over a certain percentage of – how much money you're bringing in, and if you can't basically document where that's coming from, they have grounds to deny your loan. The reason why they put rules in there like that is because they, they're looking for reasons to deny loans these right. days. They, they'll never come out and say that. But the real and, that's not and, how they make their money. Okay, correct, because you make some origination fees and some backside selling of these loans and servicing rights and things like that. But at the end of the day, who who wants to really be lending money between three and a half four percent? It right. Look at the banks. Look at how much the money the banks are making. You would say, well, how could they be making any money if they're not make, originating mortgages? Because that's not where they make their money. They make it in the casino. They make it trading. And they make it by getting free money from the Fed and then going out, investing in the stock market and derivatives and, and trading. Right. And but it could be done. And it could be done uh, with an almost win-win no matter what happens because – they know how the markets work. They have the algorithms. They make money on, you know, you see, on all their trades. They make money 90 to 100% of the time. Now, loans, right. you don't, even a, even a good loan portfolio doesn't always have that kind of rating. No. You can lose no, money. But- You've got a human element involved. You don't, you don't rig the game. You don't know if someone's going to pay or not. You can only guess and, and be prudent in your lending. And the most prudent thing they can do is not bother lending at all. Right, because the margins and, you, are low. You know exactly, but if if they if they knew that they could get closer to more of a six percent rate of return, they'd oh, be sure. more 
they'd be a lot more inclined to take those risks. I mean, and also uh, if they got more volume too. Absolutely. I mean, but you know, regardless, Lewis, whether we have interest rates at four percent or six percent, until the employment situation changes, until wage growth starts to go way up, it's not going to happen. The whole game yeah, is based on they've given up on real estate. You've seen that the the economy is going to accelerate in the second half, no matter what, irrespective of of um, real estate. They're depending now on the stock market. That is the last pillar of the recovery, and people seem to be comfortable with as long as the stock and the stock market goes up on any news or no news, it doesn't matter. It goes up, and people have become complacent that this is the what happens that we're out of the woods because the stock market's been up for so long. And this particular environment, Ryan, has taught a generation of people that you make money from speculation. You know, in the last depression, you know, if you ever talk to old timers, they're still around, taught them savings. You know, the value of a dollar, making your dollar go further, uh, saving your money and so on. You don't have the, that environment right now. Right now, you have people in Bitcoin. The price drops one hundred and twenty dollars. Everyone says, "Who cares?" Yeah, what's money? Doesn't matter. You know, this is all about speculation, and and eventually, you know, it has to end. We've been saying that the market goes up on everything and nothing continues to do so. And but people aren't buying real assets. They don't buy gold. They don't buy silver. The, the younger generation isn't buying real estate. If they have any money, they speculate with it. If they don't have any money, that's because the environment we're in. It's really a nasty situation, and it has to end at some point, Ryan. But, you know, and every new, every bit of news is good news. You had the, what was it, the initial jobless claims last week came in higher. As we mentioned, if it comes in lower, it's the sign of the massive recovery in the job market. If it comes in higher, they dismiss it. What was the headline in Reuters? Jobless claims up, but trend still points to firmer jobbing market, job market. Yeah. So we're all conditioned that everything is fine, everything is getting better, and you just keep pointing to the stock market. The problem with that, Ryan, is when the stock market goes down, there's nothing underlying any economic recovery. And right. then what do you have? And then every sudden, everyone's um, attitudes will change overnight when the stock portfolio goes down 30, 40, 50%. Then what is the yeah. Fed going to do? Are they going to print money to try to boost the stock market again? Uh, well, I, you know, I'm, I'm curious to know the same thing, and it's interesting because um, Yellen is set to speak later this week at Jackson, Jackson Hole. Jackson Hole, right. And, and the title of her speech is Labor Markets. Okay? So now she, all, all of a sudden the Fed has this, you know, they're, where they're trying to shift focus to the labor markets. Um, and I'm assuming that she's going to be <clears throat> come out and say that her major concern is basically all the seven and a half million part-time workers who want full-time right. jobs, right? So she wants to address this issue, and I think it's more of a sideshow and a distraction than anything else because um, they, a lot of people, um, economists and analysts, have really been bringing up this inflation thing, and uh, she doesn't really want to pay too much attention to it. She said ad nauseum no, that, it, that it's not really a concern of hers. Um, and that basically more jobs uh, with low pay are her concern. And I'm curious to see how this all plays out and what she says. Uh, but we know we know that last week, as you mentioned, we had initial jobless claims higher, and it didn't didn't even move the market. It, it was initial jobless claims of 311 versus 305, and it wasn't a factor in price and then mortgage pricing at all. Um, which typically there would be. I mean, well, it's a miss. It's still a miss, whether it's a $6,000 miss or not. It's not better. And like, right. as you mentioned, the headlines all over the place, or they just basically just shrug it off. And then Well, they we also, also say that it's, it's the lowest uh, number of jobless claims since 2007 before the Great Recession started. I mean, that's, those are the, the way they spin it is somehow <clears throat> everything is getting better. They don't mention that, you know, you lost all these people, full-time jobs, out of the labor force for the last six years with initial jobless claims, three, four, five, six hundred thousand a week. And now that it's slowing down, they say, well, that's good. Yeah, but when you go back to the, are people getting hired? Well, then they say, yes, we've had five, six months in a row of 200,000 people getting hired. 
dig behind the numbers and you see, yeah, a net 200,000 were hired because typically you lose 500 full-time jobs and you gain 700,000 part-time jobs. And they view all that as, well, see, it's good. We're gaining jobs and we're losing them less slowly. Right. I mean, more slowly. So. Well, then it was the day before that, Lewis, that retail sales came out for the third quarter, and it was a miss, of course. The uh-huh. number hit it was point zero versus an estimated point two, and X autos it was point two versus point four. And you know why autos obvious. are up? Because they give they give you money to buy an, a car. Right. Yeah. I mean, you might as well live in your car. You're not buying a house because it's hard to get a, a mortgage, but it's very easy to get a car loan. So that's why car easy. sales are up. Yeah, and I mean the, the subprime financing out in that in the car world is crazy right now. I mean, you know, basically anybody can get a loan. It's just a matter of at what rate. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> so that's exactly why why that would be up. I mean, people have to have a car to drive to get to to get to their part time job. Right. Um, so when people want to spend money, though, they don't have any money, so spending is down. But getting a car isn't a problem because they'll give you the money. I mean, they'll give you the loan. Yeah, and, but once again, those retail sales were just shrugged <laughs> off. It's no big deal. It was still close. It wasn't a huge miss. Um, the stock market and, continues and, to go up. But you notice what's <laughs> happening, Ryan. If you look at the aggregate, though, it goes up and then it goes down, it goes up and it goes down, but it's basically flat. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, and, and you know, we also had, um, Lewis, we've had a lot of basically all this international turmoil with Ukraine and Russia. Yeah, but you know what they say about that? Tensions are easing. Based on what? <laughs> well, based how on, are they easing? Because you're not reporting on it or because you choose to ignore it? I, I don't understand. That's what they say. That's the story of the day. Stock market is up. Gold prices are down because there's nothing to worry about. Israel's right. not still battling the Hamas and Gaza. Ukraine and Russia aren't having these problems. No, that, that's easing. Yeah, and, and so I, I agree with you. I mean, I think that they don't really dive very deep into any of that. They basically just say that everything is it's always easy, right? And and so it, it, they just kind of glance right over it and move on to the next thing. I mean, we had um, PPI data, which was last week, rising only 0.1%. So I believe it's this morning. Uh, let me look here. Yeah, it's this morning we have CPI and housing starts and permits out. Um no, doesn't matter what those numbers are, Ryan. It, it, it doesn't. But it, especially you can have a the, you can have a CPI of one point five percent in the month, and it'll be an anomaly. It'll be noise. If it's flat, they'll say we don't have enough inflation. If it's flat, they'll say, well, you see, there's nothing to worry about inflation. No matter what the number is, there's already a story behind why it's a good thing, whatever that number is. And and we typically know we've been covering these major economic events or things that are on the economic calendar for some time now it's probably less likely that it's going to be a miss anyway. It's going to be very clear, you know, somewhat near the overall expectation level of whether it's higher or lower. But if it's higher, if it's higher, they'll say it's a good thing because it shows the economy is improving. That's what they'll say when you have higher inflation. They think that that's a sign of a strengthening economy. If it's lower, they'll say, well, the Fed still has room now to keep interest rates low because inflation isn't moving higher. No matter what the number is, it's a good thing. Right. And then uh, I think they're also expecting building permits to, to, to go back above the one million level. I don't see that happening. And it doesn't um, matter if they don't. That, they're not counting on the housing anymore anyway. Right? They blame yeah, we, the we, weather we, in the first quarter for low housing sales, low new starts. And when they didn't pick up in the second quarter, we're now in the third quarter, um, they just kind of shrugged it off and said, okay, well, housing's not doing that well. We already know that, but the economy is going to accelerate in the third and fourth quarter because the stock market is going to go up. Well, that's because the feds were idiots to begin with, and they, and they felt like a low interest rate environment was going to drive housing when it didn't drive housing, and all it did was, was basically spur more private and institutional right. buying of houses, and, and it didn't work. And now we have an even lower interest rate environment right now. We still can't push housing. They can't talk about it. because it Yeah, now she's going to use lower interest rates to try to push the job market. Correct, and now they have to talk about the job market because now they have to shift their focus to something else. It can't be inflation because we know there's inflation, um, and, and it can't be about housing. So now – ABC and inflation, well, but what they'll argue now is, well, we, we, we want more inflation because inflation will help the job market. That will be their, 
their line. They'll draw a connection between inflation and the job market where none exists. And that's well, what you'll say. We were, will, we're willing to sacrifice some inflation in order to help all these people. And, or, and you're not helping them. What will happen is you'll get price inflation, and they'll still have part-time jobs, and it'll just cost them more money to buy what they can't afford today, tomorrow. But I don't even, and I don't even understand why the Fed cares to talk about employment, because what can they do? It's in their mandate. In 1979, for whatever reason, Congress said, you know what, you don't have enough power. You're, you're now in charge of the labor market. Well, I, but even if, if they're in control of the labor market, the only option that they have, the only silver bullet that they have is to continue to print money. They, right. they, they, they can give more money to these big banks and, and institutions, and essentially what are they going to do? Is that going to trickle down? No. They, those, that, that money is going to be reinvested back into it's the It's a misunderstanding market. of how the economy works to think the Fed creates jobs. It's the same thing saying the government creates jobs. It doesn't. I, I mean, All that's going to happen, Ryan, is we're going to have inflation created by the Fed because of the money printing and the low interest rates, and then you're going to have external events reduce the value of the dollar in the next few years, which will create uh, inflation through uh, increasing the price that we pay for imports. So you'll have Fed-created inflation, you'll have international-created inflation, and you won't have any jobs. And when you have inflation of that type, which is stagflation, People aren't going to buy houses then either. They might be able to buy stocks, but there's no way when prices rise and your wages don't and the Fed can't do anything about it. You can lower rates. You can, you can offer incentives. At some point, you won't even be able to do what they're doing with the car market. Right. You just can't keep giving people assets and hoping they pay back. <laughs> It doesn't work that way. See, with cars, you don't lose that much because they figure if they pay for a year or two years, you've already made a good chunk of the money back, right, because of the financing charge. Right. But, and you know, if they, people pay three or four years, they've already paid for the car. They still have five years left. They might get some out of bankruptcy. So it's a good bet to loan people money to buy cars. A little different with housing. It's a lot yeah, messier. Yeah. You use foreclosure and so on. You know, Repo, they can just come and grab your car in the middle of the night. Right. I've had a, a few conversations with some people that have been trying to buy homes lately, a couple of which were unsuccessful for um, a couple of, of reasons, mainly to do with not being able to get a mortgage for due to some financial <laughs> reasons, credit or otherwise. But um, what I found interesting was that, uh, you know, after one or two of those people had been denied for loans, they called me and they said, you know, I, this is kind of crazy. Like, honestly, we, we – you know, we didn't get the mortgage, but right after we had applied for the mortgage, um, we got about, you know, 15 to 20 credit card offers, right? Right. Of, of, of which of which they applied to two and got both of them. And I said, well, did you look at the terms? I said, because once again, remember, it, it's all about the bank here. And I said, they're, what they're going to do is it's, it's a proven model that anytime somebody applies for credit, they're more likely to apply, apply for more credit. So... When somebody applies for a mortgage, that's when you're going to see credit card offers. When you see somebody apply for a credit card, you're going to get 13 other credit card offers. And, and it doesn't mean that they're going to approve all of them, but a lot of them will start out as 0% for six months, 0% for 12 months, and then look at where that rate flips over to. It typically will flip over to 16 to 20 to, to higher than that. So the banks are not stupid. They'd rather... Well, that's good to loan. It's good to loan at 15 16% on a credit card than it is to offer a mortgage. Absolutely. Why do we want to lend to you at 4%? I'd rather give you 0% for the first 12 months <laughs> and then hammer you over the head at 19%. For, right, for because the during the first 12 months at 0%, you rack up thousands of dollars. Yeah, but and, and, and you know the, the irony behind all this is, is is that this is the way the system is set up. It's set up to, to, yeah. to, to, manip, to manipulate. I mean, it's not, you're not going to just get a loan for 4% because the banks like you. They could care right. less. You know, the only thing that they care about is their bottom line. If the loan makes sense, and, 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 and this, I know this to be true because back when they used to have common sense underwriting, that no longer exists. If you have a million dollars in the bank and you don't have enough income to support a $500,000 loan, you will not get that loan. Now, there, there's a few, there are a few private lenders that will do asset depletion, well, they'll, they'll deplete down your assets and give you credit for that income, um, but they're not going to be the most favorable terms. They're not going to be your necessarily going rate. 
Um, and it's, it's, it's honestly sad because I, I just can't rationalize to myself. If I had $500,000 to lend out, I'm not going to necessarily lend it at 4%, but there's really not even an alternative at this point. There's not. There's not like an alternative that says, hey, I'll, I'll lend the 500, not a 4%, but I'll lend it at 6%. Right. They just deny the loan altogether. You know what I mean? And I don't, I've never understood if, if Well, that's if, because if, they can't sell it back to the government because it doesn't meet their guidelines, so they're not going to make their money on it, so they just figure, why bother? Yeah, they have and, to take it not, as a portfolio loan, and it's just not worth the hassle. Right, because nobody wants to really hop back into that pri- private mortgage market. You know, it's, right, it's because then much. you're taking you're, – you're, as an employee, if you're the loan officer, you have to go and make a presentation to the board and say this is a good bet, and if it, and if it goes under, you're responsible. They'll count that as a ding against you. Whereas if you just sell everything according to the, the guidelines, even if it goes under, the bank's already sold it on to Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, whatever they do with it, it doesn't yeah. matter. So they've basically, you know, as you say, they've taken all the common sense out of it. They've taken the, they've created guidelines that don't make any sense. But yet, if you follow the guidelines that don't make any sense, you can't get in trouble. Yeah, but there's you know, no risk to you to to make that loan. Where there's risk for you to use your brain and say, well, this guy looks like he's got a good credit portfolio. Turns out you're wrong. <laughs> then you might lose your job. Yeah, but you, you make know, too many you know bad what? loans like that. But but you know, part of 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 being. Um, one of those people that sits on, you know, the board or makes decisions on whether loans are approved or not, is, is that you are, you're not doing a good job if all of your loans perform, believe it or not, because uh, that means you're leaving money on the table Correct. more times more times than not. So I, I've never understood uh, why, you know, back when, when we had the boom, the mistakes that they made were not that they created stated income loans, no income, no asset loans. It was that they were giving the wrong type of loan to that person. Like if right. you had a, a no-doc loan, but you were giving them a 30-year fixed rate that, that was fixed in and could never move, then that's a different situation than having a no-doc loan where it's a negative amortizing loan where basically they're adding principal loan to their loan the entire time and only paying interest. So it, 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 I feel like even today, if, if you gave somebody a stated income loan and they were putting 25% of their own money in their deal and they have an 800 credit score, they don't want to default on that loan. They don't. Like, because nobody wants to just give up 25% of their equity. If it, right. was, man, if it was mandated that on stated income loans or no-doc loans that you had to take fixed-rate mortgages, you couldn't even opt for an adjustable rate or you couldn't opt for a negative amortization loan, then we would have never ran into the problems we ran into. I think that on the most basic level, if you set things up, and I, and I honestly know that there's a huge market for this, there is a huge market for private mortgages. The problem is, is that everybody's scared that the government will step in and squash them, mm-hmm. right? They'll come in and they'll fine you to death, the CFPB and anybody else will right. basically put, put you out of business. And that's why nobody wants to jump into it. And it's easier for them to just take their, mon- their, their money and push it into the stock market and not worry about a thing. And, and, and yep. really, if they, want, if they want to find out how to stimulate business, you should do the same thing with business loans. You should be able to create where it makes sense if somebody's got – there's plenty of small business out there that has, has money, but they, don't, they, need, they need loans to go to the next level. Guess what? The yep. banks aren't going to lend to them. No. Nope. But if they, if they did – these are all things that would potentially stimulate growth, wage growth, jobs. But Ryan, you see, jobs. you see where the money goes. So, for example, if a company has the ability to sell a, a growth story to Wall Street, then you'll get venture capital money. And venture capitalists, you know, and I, they, they're not necessarily interested in the company's ability to turn a profit. What they're interested in is can this company – turn my $3 million investment into $80 million by going public. And, you know, if they finally make a profit 20 years from now, we don't care. What we want is a very big story. And you see it, like in real estate, Truly and Zillow. They've been out for 10 years. They don't have a profit. Each of them was sporting a market cap over a billion dollars. I think Zillow was 3 or 4 or $5 billion, and Truly is at $1 or $2 billion. They have – they – if they were to go to a bank for a loan and show them their business model and show them that one day, maybe 20 years from now, they might turn a profit, a normal bank would turn them down. They said, because you won't be able to pay us back. 
But companies like Truly and Zillow, and they exist in every every area, uh, you know, every discipline, whether it's uh, technology or software or real estate, whatever it is, they exist. They don't make money, but yet in a speculative environment, they make the best investment. Because if you invested money in Truly as a venture capital, you made hundreds of times your money back. If you invested in the IPO, you made money back. But if you invest in a company that shows a 7 to 10 percent, maybe even 15 percent earnings growth on 10, 15, 20 percent revenue growth, no one's interested in that story. And right. so that's where the money doesn't go there because the rewards are in companies that lose money because that's where you make the most money on investment. And that's why real businesses don't have a shot. The ones that employ, you know, people because, and are stable because you know they're going to be around. Now, what happens with these speculative companies, Ryan, is they get 40, 50, 100 million dollars in VC money. They burn through that, and just before they're finished burning through that, they go public and raise another 150, 250, and they can stay around another 10 years on okay. that money. <laughs> so it shows that that if you want to go if you want to start a successful business, you don't go and do the normal thing and take a loan out from the bank and meet payroll through your profits. You meet payroll through your VC money, getting your second and third rounds, and then your IPO money. Yep. And then you merge with another company. <laughs> you combine your cash, and you can stay in business even more, and you can keep telling Wall Street there's a growth story. And in a speculative environment, they buy into it. You've yeah. seen for the last four or five years – Truly and Zillow are going to do this, and they're going to do that, and they're taking – but they still don't make any money. Yep. And that's been the same story every year. But in, this, in a normal environment, people are throwing the towel in, and they wouldn't be worth billions of dollars. They'd be worth a lot less. Right. And, and as I mentioned, Zillow by themselves are not selling people houses by the amount of numbers that they even have them come into their website. It's still – People, as that we mentioned when we talked about this a few weeks back, they, they may look at Zillow to use it as a research tool, maybe to see what houses are on the market. Um, but, I mean, honestly, Louis, since that time that I called you, I've been bombarded with phone calls from Zillow almost every day, twice a day. Right, and that costs money. That right. costs Zillow money to waste time calling you and pay a salesperson. You know, they cannot piss commission. That's not going to make you buy anything. <laughs> no. Nope. Yeah, and, and I mean, it, 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 it's ironic to me because they always would call me and say that, oh, you know, your region is it, not even going to be available. I mean, it, you create that scarcity that that it's not available, and then to turn around and call you back a month later, and then, and then now... All it just it's opened up. Available. Right. <laughs> I, already, I already know that sales tactics. Every time they call, I'm like, oh, it just magically appeared, right, buddy? And, but you uh, see, Wall Street doesn't care. They just see growth numbers, and they realize if they hire enough salespeople, they will get additional sales. Even if the cost of sale is in excess of the sale they make, they can still sell, tell Wall Street, we sold more this quarter than last quarter. Yeah, and just well, just think about, Lewis, just all the brand new agents that are new to the market, right? Like, I, I guarantee you that most new agents <clears> that come on board, one of the first places that they flow to, and, and and you know that Truly and Zillow both have access to these new agents. They're going to get their phone numbers or emails. They're going to be calling them first. They call right. them and say, "Welcome to the real estate world." Right now, let us help. <laughs> Don't you, you want to be with the top traffic? Blah blah blah. The problem with Truly and Zillow's business model, other than other models like them, there is a limited number of real estate agents you can call. And once you run through a significant number of them, and if their success rate with their customers isn't that high, Word gets out, and it's very difficult to continue to sell to other real estate agents. Because there's only, uh, yeah. you know, what is there, 1.2, 1.4 million real estate agents, but we know only about maybe 80 to 120,000 actually make a living selling real estate. The rest just have the license. They sell a home a year. They sell a home every three years. They don't do anything. They have the license just because they have it. It's, you know, there's not that many customers that they can sell to, and that's no. the problem. But again, if it's a speculative environment, and it doesn't really matter because people don't read prospectuses. People don't, they don't invest on that basis. They invest on the basis that uh, it went up last quarter. It's a good growth story, so you buy it. 
Yeah, but, you know, as long as this speculative environment continues and as long as the low interest rate environment continues, as long as the Fed continues to do what they're doing, things are just going to get worse. They're not going to get better. uh, How can you criticize an investment in Trulia and Zillow when it's gone up? (laughs) Right. You can say, well, they don't make any money. Their sales, their, their sales costs are too high. Their marketing costs are too high. You can say they'll never make any money. That doesn't mean anything to an investor who has made money buying the shares and holding them. Right. Yep. And that's the problem with the current economy. Yeah. You make money not from making money. You make money by telling stories and having people believe them. You got, um, I I mean, I've read stories lately, Lewis, about um, companies that are just, uh, there's been a huge increase in uh, in profits for basically staffing agencies staffing agencies at this point mm-hmm. because people are trying to skirt around the rules right for healthcare and everything else they'd rather outsource their right. using staffing staffing companies now to hire high level executives like vice presidents and everything else right so they don't have to pay them benefits package they have to hire use the staffing company um, to go ahead and hire that person and they're, they're just going to basically outsource it to them so that they don't have to be stuck with all the rules. And this is the type of economy that we're moving to that is very dangerous. Yeah, I mean, and it makes lawyers and accountants more valuable, the cost centers normally, as actually producers. Because yeah, and, they make money figuring out how to get out of taxes, whereas if you didn't yep. have those taxes or regulation, they wouldn't have a job because they're not producing anything other than a solution to get out of something that shouldn't exist in the first place. Correct. Yeah, and, I, and it's 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 back to they always think that the the, the way to do something is is to basically uh, get at the rich or get at the big businesses, and 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 it never works. It never works. They they either move their companies overseas, they start outsourcing to staffing agencies, they basically get rid of all their workers and turn everybody into part time workers. I mean, this has all happened. Look how quickly this has happened, Lewis. It was like everybody thought that you know the rich were or big businesses were in trouble. No, they're not. They got smarter people on the other end that figure these things out just as fast, and they just adapt. They're not going to. Yeah, and those people are the people that end up working at the agency or vice versa. They they flip back and forth because they understand the rules. So you go from the SEC to the bank, and then from the bank back to the SEC, and then you pay pay a fine, but no one else can afford the fine. So the big companies do well with the regulations because they can afford to hire the the lawyers and accountants to figure it out, and then you don't get competition because the big companies keep the little people out because they can't afford to comply with the regulations. Well, half the time when these people take these positions and within government agencies or anything else, it's only to learn the ins and outs so they can right. get, back out, get back out and help their buddies when they get out. I, mean, that's the I know plenty of examples of people, I don't have to give names, where they worked at these agencies and then went to work at the banks or the law firms and then – Either they went back because they made enough money, they went back to the agency. And when they're back at the agency, then all those people are their buddies. (laughs) They're they're not going to get in trouble. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's it's, it really is. So when people argue we need more regulation, no, you don't. Because they say, where are the regulators? We have regulators. And why don't they do their job? Because the big companies, once they realize you have a big one government uh, regulatory agency, it's very easy. You don't have to bribe them. There's kind of a nod and a wink, and you're in it together. That, those agencies don't. Look at the IRS. They don't. The IRS, all of the government agencies, they're political, either political, yep. Democrat, Republican, or political crony in a sense, where they look after but there's no there, – it shouldn't be any surprise why you only have four banks left, <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, the Federal Reserve did the same thing. Was why is there no that? more Bear Stearns? Why is there no more Lehman Brothers? You know, if Bernanke said, well, I didn't have the money to bail out Lehman. Nonsense. He could have if he wanted to. Yeah. It's a J.P. Morgan probably didn't want them around. It was a very they wanted to pick up their assets. Yeah, a very strategic natural selection of who they were going to let stay right. around. Uh, yep. And uh, and 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 that's and it's it's with it's with any business that it's like. To that. argue they didn't have the money. Of course they had the money. They just print it. Well, I mean, how, how quickly could could somebody put another business out out of business if they just were like, hey, this company is really hurting my company right now. Um, 
I, we need to find a way to squash them. And, and then all the, out, of, out of thin air, there's a regulation that's created that didn't just damages this, this other company. Fender right? guitar versus Gibson guitar. I don't think Fender had anything to do with it, but I don't know if you remember the story from a couple of years ago. Gibson uh, has a U.S. plant. They make the guitars in the United States using some imported wood. They got a SWAT raid team came in, guns a blazing, you know, not blazing, but, you know, brandished. And they got raided because they supposedly had wood from Malaysia or Indonesia that was somehow improperly imported, even though it wasn't, you know. Right. And that basically they, they, they confiscated all their inventory, all their guitars. So what do you think happens to Gibson? And apparently it turns out that they, the head of Gibson had donated to Republicans. So there you go. <laughs> you have a regulation where this company is basically doing nothing wrong. They had imported the wood legally with the right permits. There was no trial. They just came in and shut them down. Yep. I mean, they took all of their guitars, and they frightened the employees. And this isn't, these aren't people doing anything illegal. They're making guitars. They're providing jobs. They're creating production. You know, and people write songs with the guitars. It, it's a good thing to have a guitar manufacturer in the United States. But yeah. that's, that's, not what, that's not how they viewed it. Someone had it out for them. Yeah, and that happens every day. You know what I mean? That, that's, it's a regulation. It's, it's, no one ran on Congress. You know, right. no one would ever say, well, you know, when I get elected, I'm going to make sure that we not only shut down that guitar plant, but that we raid them and steal all their guitars. Because that's what happened. Yeah, they get slipped into an, uh, one of those bills that, um, you know, nobody reads. That's, uh, you know, 1,500 pages long. That nobody or it's not even in a bill. To. It's in a... Um, it's done by an administrative agency where the Congress never has anything to do with it. Yeah. Yep. FDA, EPA, whatever it is. You have like the shadow government. You right. Know, where th those people have jobs for life, whereas Congress, the president, they're in and out. These people can make laws, just like the CIA. I mean, they can do whatever they want because they get appointed and they stay in power. Yeah, and, you know, it, it's just interesting because as we talk about this and I'm just thinking, We've got all these part-time workers out there. And, and how in the world Yellen or Federal Reserve, any of the members, the president, Congress, any of these people think that this ship is going to turn around, right? It, it's, it's comical. You can't it, fix – it's just like you can't fix a debt problem by issuing more debt. You can't fix government-created hindrances on job growth with more hindrances or more, more programs. Well, you, you can't fix stupid with more stupid either. You know what I mean? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you just can't. You can't and, just do uh, more of what didn't work. Right. But, but that's and, the and, mentality. To oh, them, and, doing and, nothing would be, the, for, would be the best thing. But to them, doing nothing would show that they're not needed. Well, and I think it's, you know, there's the flip side of it that, you know, if there's these people that maybe be in Congress or economists that listen to our podcast that would say, well, looks like you guys are stupid because you don't have your money in the stock market. Right? Like, exactly. It, 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 they just play the other side of it because it's easier. It to, works. Yeah, you can show that, hey, look at this train. It's going up, 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 and up. And then it's look at how, and we, we're responsible for it. We created this. Right. And then, but then, of course, they, when it crashes, they had no idea. They didn't know. It was unforeseen. It wasn't their fault. But don't worry. They'll fix it. No, you know, the way they fix it is, is because it's like there's like a hundred band of brothers that all get together and they all cry. Everything, everything went terrible, and then they go and they, and they go start another venture capital. But people will ask uh, for it, Ryan. If the stock market crashes and people lose their 401ks, most of the population will ask for the government to fix it, to make right. it better, not realizing that they, yeah. they made it worse, that they caused yep. the problem in the first place. Yeah, I 100% I, I agree with that, and that's the unfortunate part about it. <laughs> that, that is. I mean, look, at you had the um, – the financial crisis of 2008 was obvious why that, why that happened, and yet the Fed was in charge of fixing it. Yeah. And, of course, they did fix it, supposedly. <laughs> yeah. Well, they've definitely fixed it, all right? It's, it's, it's uh, you know, we, we continue to have a lower interest rate environment, and real estate's not moving, stock market's moving higher, um, same institutional buying, cash sales, uh, part-time working economy. I mean, yeah, they definitely fixed it. But, they fixed it you know, for enough people for there to be a minority that's complaining. 
Oh, they fixed it for their buddy. And an unpowerful minority that's complaining. Because they're the ones without any money and without enough votes to change things. Well, yeah, sure. I mean, the Fed can, you know, these Fed chairs can, once they're done with their post there, they can go get jobs at one of the buddies that they helped out. Um, It's no different than anybody else that takes one of these positions. Uh, And they can say what they want. They can, and you know, they got different Fed officials saying different things to try to offset each other to make it seem like they're not Oh, you saw that in the last week, right? Right. Someone Jellen says something about bubbles. Williams says something else. And you saw this guy, Fisher. He's talking about bail-ins the other day. Where'd that come from? Why why are we talking about bail-ins when the banks are supposedly, you know, in tip-top shape after $4 trillion of QE? Why, why are you talking about we need to figure out a bail-in structure? And we're working on that now. Yeah, you know, that gets slipped into one of his speeches. And, and the press just ignores it and talks about his out, outlook on the economy. doesn't talk about why he's talking about bail-ins. Now, he didn't say deposit or bail-ins, Ryan. But he's talking about creating special debt. Well, who's going to buy that kind of debt, which is essentially convertible in case the bank fails and you get equity in the bank? I know why he's talking about it, because if they don't sell enough of that debt, guess where they're going to have to go? They're going to have to go to the depositors. Yep. See, they're very slippery. They talk about bail and say, we weren't talking about depositors. The word bail in is synonymous with Cypress and grabbing depositors' money when the bank has trouble. Exactly. Yep. Why would anybody want to put their money in a bank? If, right, if, and why would no. anyone want to buy debt that says we'll convert to equity? There's nothing worse than a, than a bank that has to convert to equity because it doesn't have any money left. That's not like a company that has assets. It means there's no value in the bank. Right. What good does and it do it, to have equity in a bank that, that can't operate? And, and not to mention, it's like you said, why would he even bring that up when, there's, when the banks are probably supposed to be on such you know, sound financial ground right now? Right? Yeah, and they're working on it. The United States doesn't say who, but what's even more troubling is the media just ignores it. <laughs> I, put, I, I put out a little article, and I just put a little snippet on the piece. It got picked up in a lot of the major uh, alternative media. And I got five, ten thousand visits because people see that I'm like, what's this? Yeah. <laughs> I didn't see this. This was news to people because it wasn't reported on. Yeah. Bail ins, bail outs, we don't talk about that. Might well, worry people. But here's a guy now I you know what's funny about it is here's a guy who used to be on the board of governors of Israel. Now why he's in the United States, I don't know. Secondly, he's given a speech in Stockholm. I love these guys are always when they make these speeches, sometimes in the <laughs> United States. But the vast majority of these speeches that the Fed members give are overseas. Yep. Even Stockholm yakking about this. Yep. Uh, it is definitely interesting. He's talking um, about the United States like in the third person. You know, well, the United States is going to institute uh, bail-ins, and they're working on a proposal. Right. Like, I don't know who those people are, but that's what they're doing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it is – I, and, and that stuff should be front page news, and it never is. And well, and so I guess that's why you know we have our podcast because we at least get to talk about these things that nobody else wants. And to. a few and a few hundred people will learn. <laughs> yeah. Hey, but you know what? It's a few hundred people are just you know at least figure out what's taking place. It's, it's better than nobody, right? That's true. Um, so we're coming up on the end of the show, Lewis. Um, if you wouldn't mind, give our listeners your blog so they can check out your blog post that you had mentioned, um, and any contact information you, you want to give. Sure. Smallgold.com, S-M-A-U-L-G-L-D. And there's a blog post up there every few days on some of the topics we talk about in the show, the Federal Reserve, gold, silver, economics, real estate, and so on. So please check that out at smallgold.com. You can also follow me on Twitter at Smallgold. Thanks, awesome. Ryan, and thanks, thanks everyone. Thanks, most Appreciate it. Guys, remember, download, subscribe, share on iTunes, search Real Estate 360. You can also visit the website and stream the show there and all the previous shows at realestate360live.com. Until next time, take care.